because he owned all these slaves. You know, our third American president had uh, 660 slaves. In fact, if you think about this little uh, detail, uh, you, it's, a, it's a, a stunning, right? Mm -hmm. The first five presidents of the United States, four of them are slave owners. And among them, they owned hundreds and hundreds of slaves. But Jefferson owned the most, 660. And the only slaves he ever freed were his own children, mm -hmm. with Sally Hemings. That's amazing. And yet, he was against the slave trade, but he couldn't give up slavery. Why not? This man who said all men are created equal. Why couldn't he give it up? Farming. Huh? His farming? Well, yeah, his, his farming, his lifestyle, his house, all the things the slaves did. And uh, he was not a very pleasant slave owner. And this is, you know, surprising. Uh, this most famous of all Americans. You know, when he ran for the United President of the United States, he got like 96% of the vote. This is unbelievable. Uh, and it was much, much beloved, and yet actually he was a kind of a, he's kind of very much at cross purposes with himself, you might say. Uh, anyway, there was a man named Clement Moore. Now, Clement Moore, I'm sure you've heard of, yeah. Where does that name come into history? Huh? I'm thinking that before Christmas. Yes. He's the, he wrote the most famous poem in American history. It was the night before Christmas. And Clement Moore wrote this in 18, uh, approximately 1821 for his children. But back in 1806, uh, he had written this pamphlet against Jefferson. And he just, he goes on about Jefferson equating, uh, Jeff, here's Jefferson, just roughly, Jefferson's idea of the way people should be thought of. White people, you know, they're, they're the highest form of, of nature, and then black people, second form, and then the third level are the apes, and the gorillas, and the orangutan. You know, so it was like, he, he really, he really had a very low opinion of, of African people. And uh, I think if you'd ask him, let's say Jeff Jefferson were here tonight. So Jefferson, why were you this, had these attitudes about these people? He'd say, well, it's kind of like children. They're, they're like children. You love these children, but you, they have to be taken care of. And they, you know, they're, they're, they, they'll hurt themselves. They won't do very well without your direction. In other words, you see the point, you know, this is a very elitist idea. And yet at the same time, he would not let his own slaves learn how to read, how to write, with the exception, of course, of his own children, who he um, uh, allowed to have limited, you know, kind of limited education. By the way, two of his <coughs> grandchildren, no, three of his grandchildren were in the Civil War. This is amazing. His grandson by his first wife, well his only wife, became Randolph, became the Secretary of War for the Confederacy. Hmm. And then he had this affair, many year affair with Sally Hemings, his slave, but what you just have to understand is that his wife and Sally Hemings were half brother and sister, half sisters. Hmm. And here's the most amazing part of all: Sally Hemings looked like his wife. You know, it'd be like marrying the sister, right? And so when they, when Jefferson was the first president to have his presidency in the White House. There were only three people that moved in. Jefferson, the secretary, who was a man by the name of Lewis. Have you ever heard of Lewis and Clark? Mm -hmm. Right? So his secretary. But Lewis, and then Lewis said, well, I'm not going to do this alone. 
I got to do it with somebody else. You know, I have to, somebody back me up. So he chose this man named Clark. So Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark out fast. But anyway, uh, and then the third person living there as a maid was Sally Hemings. But she was, she was a maid, but she was a lot more than a maid, right? <laughs> well, anyway, Clement Moore, this, this is what, what I love history. So Clement Moore, remember he wrote, the, he wrote this diatribe against Jefferson, 1806. Then in 1824, he's left in a will to slave. <laughs> and boy does his tune change fast. <laughs> you know, these slaves come and do all this work and all these things for him. And he just thinks it's great. So he goes from being anti-slave to being pro-slave. And so, you know, there were a lot of Northerners. This is 1820, so the North hasn't gotten into abolition yet, right? So abolition is a, a, takes a long time. And uh, that's why I think it's kind of extraordinary that um, we look back at this time and, and, and don't realize the North had slavery, many of these states, until the 1820s. In fact, New York State did not get rid of slavery until 1826. So before that, you know, people had slaves. The rich people had slaves. And Clement Moore is a rich person who lives in New York. Uh, there's a very famous <coughs> Frenchman that came to visit. Um, New York, I mean, came to a visit named Alexei de Tocqueville. And de Tocqueville said some astonishing things, which I want to mention to you about America. He said that he had come, he was sent by the French government to examine American institutions and American prisons and how America dealt with certain problems. And de Tocqueville, what knocked him over, and, and he wrote this in his book, in 1835 called Democracy in America, that how Americans automatically would create these associations and organizations to, uh, for, for various projects, right? Again, crusades, right? Americans love to come together and create an organization around uh, a crusade, around a cause, that they feel is important. And he said, this is the most amazing thing of all, right? Because in Europe, you know, everything has to be approved by the government, right? But in America, just people get together and kind of co coalesce. And uh, to this day, you know, Americans have conventions all the time, right? Every organization has a convention. <laughs> and it's like, you know, Americans are going to conventions for various groups. I'll go to three or four a year, you know? It's just, it's just what we do. He also mentioned how hardworking were the Americans, and that there was really in the North no aristocracy, but in the South there was an aristocracy, and he was very much against slavery, but for this reason. He said, slavery induces idleness, because what happens is this. Those people that have money, they don't have to do anything. In fact, they're not supposed to do anything. They just can uh, read their books and write their papers and go to balls and have a good time, right? Just like the royalty of Europe. But the slaves, on the other hand, they're motivated to work as little as possible. This is one of the great ironies. So culturally speaking, the slaves live in a community where they learn to just do barely enough to not get whipped, right? And then when the cotton come in, they, they had to really get, because they had to get the cotton in quick. And so what they did, this seems like unbelievable, but they would pay extra to the slave. You know, if you bring in so much cotton, we're going to give you all this extra pay. And so then they would have a big party once the cotton was all in and they don't blow the money usually. But, but, but I thought the Tocqueville you know, had, some, had, a, had a great point. Well, anyway, there were abolitionists 
of um, who people started espousing themselves, calling themselves in the 1830s abolitionists. One of those men you probably have heard of was named uh, P.T. Barnum. P.T. Barnum was a great abolitionist and uh, was always promoting the cause. Anyway, in the 1833, the American Anti-Slave Society. Now, we're, we're working on limited resources. So, I, I know it's pretty bad. Don't run out of spit. Yeah, I, as long as I don't run out of spit, it's probably okay. Anyway, the, the name I wanted to write up here, if I can get some of my stuff together here, was a man named William Lloyd Garrison. Mm. William Lloyd Garrison. Now, William Lloyd Garrison, 1833, in Boston, creates the American Anti-Slave Society. Now, th there had been another organization um, that came along about this time called the American Colonization Society. Now, the American Colonization Society, one of the great backers of it was a man named Henry Clay. And Clay's idea was that you, pro you solve the slave problem by sending all the Africans back to Africa. And so they raised all this money and they gather up all these slaves and since they're slaves, you know, they don't ask them, say, do you want to go to Africa? No, they just put them on a ship and they send them to Africa and they end up in a country known as Liberia. Hmm. Liberia was, was founded at least from the standpoint of uh, its civilization, a quote unquote, uh, by American slaves. The capital of Liberia is, anybody know? Monrovia. <laughs> Monrovia. See, President Monroe was a big supporter of the American Colonization Society. And I think this is just so kind of amazing um, that they then recreated America in Monrovia, Liberia, complete with slaves. And then they became slave owners and all this kind of thing. And the American dollar was the official <coughs> currency in uh, Liberia for, well, until actually recent times. In other words, they just modeled themselves after America. But, you know, this was like a, a drop in the bucket, right? They, America had something like four million slaves at the time of the Civil War, and, uh, you know, they were only sent back, at, you know, some shiploads went over there. So it wasn't really much of a solution. But um, I want to talk to you uh, then about First of all, one of the most famous of all abolitionists, because this lady um, did something which made her maybe the most influential of all the abolitionists. I don't think she intended this at all. Her name was Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now Beecher here, her father was a well-known congregational minister. In fact, her father had been one of the founders of the American Anti-Slave Society. Harriet Beecher Stowe was a girl from New England who was very, um, very committed, you might say, to the, the, the abolitionist cause, but she was busy. She had, she, her husband had become a seminary teacher at a seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so they lived in a house up on a hill, uh, which, which Robin uh, took me through when she was in Cincinnati. And Harriet Beecher Stowe, in that house, with seven children, seven children, She'd take care of the children all day long and at night, and then late at night, after the last kid went to sleep, 
You know what she, what she did? He started writing a book. We know the book as Uncle Tom Cabin. But she didn't write it as a novel in one piece. She wrote it in 40, in, excuse me, in 20 sections that were then published. Each one of those was divided and published in the newspaper as a weekly series. Mm. And so people would get their newspaper and read it and then the next week get the next one. So she, she was, they were publishing it before she actually had it, had it finished. And so Harry Beecher Stowe um, told about the horrors. The thing that, as an abolitionist, she would just drove her completely mad, was that she, they were up on the hill. They could, there was a place up there they could look down and see the Ohio River and see the slaves and the winter on ice trying to get across. They, and, and they would, and then sometimes they'd make it, but then sometimes they would see a uh, slave chaser would come and grab them and drag them back to Kentucky. And uh, this is just a tug at her heart. So she created this story of Uncle Tom and uh, his life, and then she created based on, so she had traveled a little bit in the South. One story is that she was in Louisiana and there was a man there that she based the overseer on, whose name was Simon Legree. Mm -hmm. And so Simon Legree has been immortalized as kind of this evil man. So she published this for the first time in 1851. The installments started coming out. And uh, it was the best-selling novel of the 19th century. Wow. Now that's saying something because, you know, this is the time of Mark Twain, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the time of, of Hawthorne. <coughs> all these other famous writers, she outsold them all with mm. one book. Mm. Uncle Tom's Cabin. By the way, this is a strange history note. When she, later her husband, moved back to Connecticut, and they settled down in Hartford, Connecticut, in kind of a new area, and built a, a beautiful mansion because she was loaded, you know, from all this money from the book. Guess who built a house next to door to her? Unbelievable. Mark Twain. Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens' home is right next door to Harry Peter Stone in Hartford, Connecticut. And so, in fact, it was so, it sold so well, it out, almost outsold the Bible at a certain point. I guess no book has ever outsold the Bible. Because you're always selling Bibles, no matter <laughs> what, what period of history. Now, during the war, uh, around 1862 or three, she got invited to Washington D.C. and uh, she was at a special reception uh, at the White House, and she got to meet Abraham Lincoln in line. And so this this is the story that goes like this. So she was waiting in line to meet Lincoln, and finally she came up to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln, and uh, she said, uh, President, um, my name is Harriet Beecher Stowe. And he said, oh, so you're the little lady that started the Civil War. <laughs> what a great line. So you're the little lady that started the Civil War. That's how important Harriet Beecher Stowe was. And uh, she, she was, of course, very upset, as most Americans were. When, in 1850, there was a fugitive slave law. And uh, she, the fugitive slave law is what allowed these, these uh, slave chasers to come across the ice. And they would even come into Ohio and, and, and grab them and take and drag them back. And uh, this, is, this is very, very hard. Uh, Uncle Tom, of course, was a good Christian man, and Simon Legree was anything but. I mean, it's a, it's a, a melodrama, right? But uh, it was effective because what happened is it was turned into a play. Now, it's the play that spread worldwide. Anywhere in the world, in about 100 languages, 
they went to do Uncle Tom's Cabin. Mm. And people would bawl and cry and carry on. And so Harry Beecher Stowe had a lot to do with abolition, not just in America, but with all over the world, because slavery, you know, it's hard to kill out. There's still, there's still slavery going on today. And there are people in this country enslaved, although they're hidden, well hidden away from the public. Uh, they're here. Now, in uh, all of this came to a head in the 1850s. And this, what had been uh, just a, a movement, started to evolve into a political, uh, shall we say, uh, what's the word for it, kind of a storm. You know, it just, it just kind of get more and more steam. So in the 1850s, there were a group of French communists. They're called phalanxers. Now, this is a word you need to know. Phalanxes. Phalanxers. They were followers of a French man named Fourier. Now, Fourier, I think most people would agree he was a he was a nutcase, but he was but he was a very, very much for the idea of the French Revolution, primarily the idea of equality, egalitarianism, equality of people, and uh, so he sent out these missionaries, if you will, of his gospel. These phalanxers were going to live move all over the world, and they were going to be a model community everywhere they went. And so he sent them, lots of groups, to America. And one group we know that was known as the La Reunion Group came to what, what is today Dallas, Texas. And they settled in Oak Cliff. And the Spalangsers uh, found out they were up there in the escarpment in Oak Cliff, which is, you know, about a mile <coughs> deep of limestone. And you can't hardly grow anything. They wouldn't grow their grapes, you see. So they ended up having to survive. They had to fish the Trinity River. Now, this is almost unimaginable now, right? But at that time, the Trinity River, you know, was crystal clear. It was just loaded with fish. So they took their fish traps down there, and they collected their fish, and bring them up the hill, back up the escarpment. This is called Chalk Hill, in, you know, locally speaking. And uh, that's all limestone. That's why the cement plants were built along the escarpment, all the way down to Midlothian. And um, anyway, if you go down today by Pinkston High School, you will find Fish Trap Road, mm -hmm. road yes, where they would go, you know, walk down, take their fish traps, yes. and then right also there by Pinkston is the old French colony yes. cemetery where so many of them are buried. But most of them eventually moved out. Well, anyway, so we had uh, this French communistic group who eventually, in the 1850s, moved over across the Trinity where John Neely Bryant was, but John Neely Bryant uh, had left. He'd gone to California. And so the early settlers of Dallas were these French communists known as the La Reunion Colony. Well, anyway, there was a Wisconsin version of this. It's called the Wisconsin Phalanx. So the Wisconsin Phalanx was, again, these very free-thinking, egalitarian, French people, and they were very, very upset because they thought that somebody should do something about slavery. And neither political party at that time, or the Whigs, of course, and the Democrats, were doing anything about slavery. <coughs> they would pay lip service, they would got to make a change, but they wouldn't do anything. So there was a man in the Wisconsin Phalanx, his name was Alan Bovey. And Alan Bovey, was really an abolitionist. And he said, we'll set up 
we'll have a meeting and see if we can set up some kind of political organization. So he said, meet at the little white schoolhouse. So he called together the Bayland's people and the local farmers and others, and they all came together. And he said, I want to open the discussion about creating a political party. Number one goal will be abolition. And then, you know, free, free land for the immigrants and a lot of other things. But that was the main thing. So here, so here Alan Bovey got the thing started. And that night, they decided, they voted, the group there, created a new political party. And that political party would be dedicated to abolition. Now, what should they call this party? Well, they were from France. And they held in great esteem and honor the French Republic. They believed that the original French Republic was dedicated, de dedicated to egalitarianism. So that French Republic, they used the word republic. And they called themselves Republicans. Now, in one of, again, history's great ironies, the Republican Party, as it exists today, was founded by French communists who came over from <laughs> France and said, and uh, in the little white schoolhouse, if you go to Wisconsin and go to Ripon, Wisconsin, and you'll see the little white schoolhouse, there's a sign out front, and it says, birthplace of the Republican Party. I think that's pretty great. <laughs> now, um, one of the great martyrs, maybe the greatest martyr of the abolitionist cause, was a man named John Brown. Now, John Brown, of course, this story is, I'm sure, well known to all of you. John Brown had spent a lot of time of his life uh, in the abolitionist cause, but he was of a violent nature. He said, you know, we've got to fight. So he was fighting slave owners out in Kansas. And he, uh, by the way, just to show you connection here, um, Ulysses S. Grant, who became the, the great leader of the Union Army, lived with the Browns in Ohio. Amazing, right? So, John Brown ultimately has a scheme that he is going to free the slaves in this way. He's going to take over the great military armory at Harper's Ferry, where they both manufactured and stored guns and ammunition. And his idea was he and his men would go in, take take over that, and then take all the guns and give them to the slaves out in the, out in the countryside. Well, this was a you know pretty audacious idea. So as soon as he did that, the United States military sends in three men, three men who are going to get John Brown. You want to take a shot at these names? Robert E. Lee, who was again a Union or a uh, Army officer, Stonewall Jackson, and Jeb Stuart. Three of the greatest of the leaders of the Confederate military. And those three, by the way, are the ones that are up on Stone Mountain in Georgia, at that great Confederate shrine, which is now just a little postage stamp of a thing. It was going to be huge. You know how big Stone Mountain is? It's going to be this huge thing. And they had hired Gutson Borglum, this Mormon guy, the Danish Mormon guy, to build this great memorial for the Confederates. And he was working away on it. And then the Daughters of the Confederacy got unhappy with him. And so he said, uh, I've had enough of this. He takes all the dynamite he has and blows it up. <laughs> and he said, I think I'll do something else. And what he did, of course, he left Stone Mountain went up to the Black Hills, South Dakota, and built Mount Rushmore. And took him the rest of his next 30 or 40 years to sculpt out of granite the faces of Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt. 
Well, anyway, John Brown then uh, was the great hero. Uh, there was a man present at the, uh, at the hanging of John Brown there in Harper's Ferry who hated the abolitionists and hated John Brown. So he was an actor. He dressed up as a Union soldier just so he could see John Brown die, hung by the neck. His name was John Wilson. Well, no so just think about it, 1859, all the principals are there. John Brown's there, Robert E. Lee, Jeff Stewart, John Wall Jackson, and of course, John Lewis Booth. <coughs> see, it is, and a lot of people really kind of see 1859, Harper's Ferry, as the beginning of the war, because once they killed, uh, once that he was killed, he became a martyr for the cause, and they wouldn't, they couldn't tolerate the idea uh, that the, the South somehow won, you know, somehow could carry on the slavery. Uh, and uh, so John Brown became kind of a rallying cry. Well, anyway, there was a, um, oh, I love this little fact. John Brown had 20 children. <laughs> when, he died, when he died, he left 20 children, you know. Uh, be taken care of by his wife. Um, the one more piece of this. There was a famous abolitionist in New England by the name of Julia Ward Howe. H-O-W-E. Julia Ward Howe. And uh, she had uh, spent years and years you know, trying to get the abolitionist movement going. And Julia Ward Howe um, was invited in 1862 to come to Washington, D.C. to watch as these Union soldiers went off to war. They would march through the streets of Washington, they'd cross the Long Bridge, and then they'd go off into war. And uh, each regiment, as they went by the reviewing stands, where Julia Ward Howe was sitting with her husband, with her, husband, with her minister, they, each regiment, regiment would come by and they'd sing a song. They'd, they'd have a regimental song. And one of the groups that came by, one of the regiments, was singing this song that I'm sure is familiar to you. It goes like this. John Brown's body lies a moment in the grave. Right? And uh, she heard that and she said, that's horrible. <laughs> horrible. Here the, here's John Brown our great hero, and they're talking about him mowering in the grave. Awful. What, they, what Judy Ward Howe didn't realize is they weren't talking about her John Brown, the famous Harper's Ferry John Brown. The regiment was singing about a drunken sergeant that would stay drunk most of the time named John Brown. <laughs> and the reason he was motoring in the grave is because he had taken so much alcohol into his body that the body would not decay. It's like being embalmed, right? And and so they would thought this was great, funny joke, you know, because they all remembered how John Brown would stagger around all the time. And uh, but she turned to her minister friend from New England and said, "So this, I mean, what are we?" Can we do something? And he said to her, there, yeah, there's something you can do. You can, when you get home, write a poem about the great cause, you know, about the great work of John Brown, and put it in, uh, and we'll, we, we'll use that too, John Brown's body too. And she said, I, I, you know, I don't think I can do it. He said, you know, I've seen you write some poems. I'll, I'll bet you can. So they go back to the Willard Hotel. Now, the Willard Hotel, of course, later became famous because that's the place almost every night where Ulysses S. Grant would come with his wife, have dinner. And then afterwards, he would sit in the lobby and he would drink and smoke his cigars. And when he got a little bit tipsy, people would come to him and say, President Grant, would you please 
help us, we're trying to build a bridge over here in Kentucky. And he'd say, sure, I'll be glad to help you. And then, you know, he would, he would uh, pass that word along to somebody who would write it down. And uh, sometimes they would just, just when they were shaking his hand, you know, put a little money in it or something. And so from that, what became a routine, uh, developed the word lobbyist. Uh, lobbyist. Um, the word lobbyist, the first lobbyist went to, in the lobby to talk to Grant. Well, anyway, it was in this Willard Hotel, 1862, where G. Ward Howe went to bed and went to sleep, and in her mind, you know, it's John Brown's body, and it's morning, great, just went through her head. At three in the morning, she woke up, and all of a sudden, these words came to her out of the blue. She just got up quick, went to a little desk, and wrote them down. Same tune, different words. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has trampled out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has the loose his terrible lightning. With his terrible swift sword, his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Yeah. Right. That, of course, is the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which became the number one hit of the Civil War era, became the anthem for the North, and, and uh, it all just came to her in one flash, all because she thought they were talking about her John Brown. Now, I, I just, you know, I marvel at how these things happen. It's, you know, it's, it's more than coincidence. It's just like, um, it's uh, almost like it's intended or divine in some way, right? Divine synchronicity. Yeah, synchronicity, exactly. Well, anyway, um, that that's, uh, of all of the abolitionists, that became the most famous song of, of the abolitionists and then of the Civil War. And that, and then of course, John Brown became the great martyr of the Civil War. And they're kind of interconnected, you see, in a very strange sort of way. Now, the, the, the next movement I want to talk about is a movement known as the temperance movement. Now, temperance, of course, originally meant to temper the amount of alcohol you take in. In uh, 1800, it, uh, the average, if you took all the Americans and then divided that number by the alcohol that was consumed, it comes out to about four gallons a year of 200 proof alcohol. True. <coughs> that, and of course, you know, kids aren't drinking alcohol and so on. So it gives you some idea, you know, the, 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 how many, much people were drinking. So anyway, the American Temperance Society was founded in 1826, by guess who? Again, uh, this British guy who gets me and everything, Lyman Beecher, uh, our, uh, who is co founder, our father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. But anyway, I want to talk to you a little bit about the temperance movement because it's quite actually amazing how powerful this organization became and it's amazing to me how um, unsuccessful it was in the end. I mean, it turned out to be a colossal bust, but it was, it was a magnificent bust in its own way. Uh, let me give you a little background. Um, in 1833, in England, there was a temperance group that was promoting the idea of less alcohol. Eventually, the Temperance Society comes to the conclusion there should be no alcohol. And they worked and worked for prohibition, which means the end of all alcohol in the United States, which they got as a constitutional amendment. You know how hard it is to get a constitutional amendment? It's almost impossible, right? They got a constitutional amendment in 1920. And the thing was total, complete, and utter disaster. It lasted 13 years. Now, in England, about 100 years before this, 
1833, you have the Preston Temperance Society. There was a man named John Turner. Now, John Turner had a terrible st st stutter. He had a hard time saying things. And so he said, I, 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 I am t -t 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 totally and forever committed to abstinence. Let me repeat this to see if you can figure out what's going on here. I am t -t -t totally <coughs> committed to abstinence. T -t 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 -t. Hear it? T toddler. Uh -huh. You know what a teetotaler is? Teetotaler is a person who drinks no alcohol. And they, you know, they make fun of him uh, for this, and yet at the same time, that while making fun of him, they they also remembered what he said. And he would say this over and over. I'm a teetotaler. Teetotaler. I'd always wondered. Where does this word mean? Tea? You know, like tea, you drink tea? Mm -hmm. No, it's T-E-E. -E. But it's not even T-E, -E, it's just two T's. <coughs> t t t t t t t <laughs> And that's where they got the word T-Tobler. Uh, this Richard Turner was the first T-Tobler. And, uh, and people still use the expression. So you want to drink? No, I'm a T-Tobler. Right? Comes, came out of a guy stammering. <laughs> it's really, really unusual. And by the way, if you were a teetotaler, you'd sign your name, Robin Lenny T. Brian Lenny T. Bell Sloniker T. T for teetotaler. Isn't that good? You know, just like the uh, Jesuits. Sign, the, sign your name, Father So and So S J, Society of Jesus. Right? People don't do these tag-ons much anymore, but back in the old days, these were real popular. You wanted everybody to know, you know, that you didn't drink. That was like a big deal. So, how did these people identify themselves? I find this amazing. They started the habit of wearing blue ribbons. So if you saw somebody with a blue ribbon, that meant they were for prohibition and they were uh, the American temperance movement uh, followers. It kind of like, um, um, see if I can remember how this goes. They were at some, mm, sometimes I have a story, but uh, some of the details has fallen in place. Maybe you can help me with this, Robin. There was a an event back in um, England, and people would, they were so thrilled. I it might have been Amy Simple. And uh, people would be so thrilled, they would start waving their handkerchiefs. Are you sure that's not something Wesleyan? Yeah, maybe this? Wesley. Because I said, well, some of my person's going to be in your gym at 20. It's yeah, later. I don't know, much later. But they did this at her rallies. I know yeah. they did, but did yeah. I, I, I mean, it's earlier. It's earlier, and it, mm -hmm. was it something it might be coal Wesley. miners, and they were waving the... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I can re I have like a the I can remember encyclopedia of all of his stories, so I'm just trying to like read <laughs> into something that will yeah. remind you. Yeah, yeah she's, she's, she's my backup now. Yeah, now, so that my, weave, now that my brain is starting to back up with all this, all this stuff in it, right? Yeah. And, and then it'll pop out at some time. Anyway, um, one of the important events that happened in this whole thing was the creation of the WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Union. When I was... Uh, in high school, somebody invited me to a WTCU meeting over at the Methodist Church. And I'd never been in the Methodist Church, and I had no idea what WTCU was, so that was enough inspiration for me. You know, I like, uh, I kind of like Bill Sloniker, I like the adventure of the thing, even though it might be a dud. But a lot of times, Surprising things come out when you go somewhere that you're that you don't know uh, what's going to happen. Well, 
anyway, the, uh, th this, this is what happened. I went and they were talking, and this is 1950s, late 1950s. They're talking about prohibition. Prohibition was over in 1933. They're still trying to get prohibition in, right? <laughs> and so this organization still exists. You know, it's kind of like the March of Dimes. Think about this a minute. The March of Dimes' purpose was to eradicate polio. For all intents and purposes, polio was eradicated in the United States in the early 1960s. We still have the March of Dimes today. So what does this tell you? This tells you that organizations have a life of their own, right? They, they, they want to carry on even though their purpose is gone. So what they did in the March of Dimes is they started focusing on what? Birth defects. Yes. Right. Now they're never going to run out of birth defects, right? <laughs> right? So that was a smart move because, see, they cranked up the organization. All this money is just pouring in, right? And these large foundations in America, like the Carnegie Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, they have so much money. The money just keeps pouring in if they don't do anything. You remember Getty, the, the richest man who works at the Getty Foundation? They spent millions and millions on these two great Getty museums in California and all the art that went in them. And when they were all done, they had more money left over than what they started with. Because they, they just much of this wealth of foundation is in in shares, stocks, right? Yeah, and uh, and that just keeps you know going up. They have their own investors, and they have their own investors who are smarter than Warren Buffett. <laughs> uh, Warren Buffett. The, I have to tell you Warren Buffett story. You know these are like, these are like pro stories, right? Warren Buffett said what I thought was the greatest thing. He, somebody asked Buffett, they said, Buffett, not expecting him to answer, they said, how did you become the richest man in the world? And he stops dead in his tracks and said, oh, that's easy. So all the reporters, oh, really? You're going to tell us how I became the richest man in the world? You know, they're getting ready to write it all down. He says, I have two rules. Don't lose the money. Uh, no. Uh, that's a good rule. Don't the, those that have the gold make the rules. Yeah. But he said, I have two rules. The first rule is you never, ever, under any circumstances, have a committee meeting. <laughs> yeah. And, and they kind of puzzled over that. But if you know anything about Buffett, that's how he works. He never works, in, there's never a committee meeting. He's always, he's always talking to Brian or Roger. Or Bill, you know, just talking to them, and each one of them is an expert on something. Charlie. Yeah, and uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, so he, uh, so they say, well, 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 okay, okay, okay. What's the second? They're all anxious to hear. And he says, the second rule is never, ever, ever forget the first rule. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No matter what, don't lose the nine one. You don't forget rule number one. Yeah, well, that's another way of putting it. But this idea of not having committee meetings, if you've ever been in an organization of any size, Bill and I have been one of size, you know, they're just endless meetings and they're so they're, they're so ineffective at getting things done. And uh, so anyway, um, I wanted to, because our time is just almost up, I want to mention one more movement and uh, uh, even though I'm not finished with the temperance movement, oh, well, there are a couple things I've got to say about the temperance movement. One is that uh, um, one of the great temperance groups of all time was the Salvation Army. Now, the Salvation Army was founded by General Booth, who was a Methodist preacher. And, uh, but the idea there was to work with people directly. Right? Don't send off people. You work with the people directly and in the gutter and all of this. And uh, so the Salvation Army, were, of course, very big pro prohibition and very big temperance people. And uh, the, uh, so that led to the creation of the Skeleton Army. The Skeleton Army 
were people who were, were, were selling alcohol, promoting booze, running uh, saloons and so forth. And so these people would get organized, they'd break up Salvation Army meetings. And uh, so they're called the Skeleton Army. So the Salvation Armies, you know, they've always been kind of on the fringe because they deal with today with drug addicts and all this, you know, stuff. <coughs> Here's a name I want to throw out at you. You probably never, you probably heard this name, Carrie Nation. Mm -hmm. Anybody oh, yeah. heard of Carrie Nation? Oh, yes. She was from Brazoriaville, Texas, and uh, was a Methodist. Yet another, how many Methodists do we have? Endless numbers of Methodists. And uh, she joins the WTCU. Now, she became famous because she wanted to end alcohol. So she had a hatchet. The hatchet became her symbol. And she would go into saloons. And because she was a woman, they wouldn't restrain her. And so she would go and you know, chop into the barrels. Uh, booze and uh, and chop, try to chop the the bar down and all of this stuff. So Carry Nation it became quite a symbol of the prohibition movement back in the 18 late 1800s. Now one one other thing I want to mention and then we'll close this uh, about women's suffrage. Women's suffrage and the temperance movement are very closely tied together. There was a famous 1848 Seneca Falls meeting, um, in which, which was also, by the way, in a Methodist chapel, uh, yeah. where women came together with the idea of extending the vote to women. Now, this is the 1840s, right? It takes a long time for these people to get what they want. And uh, they're at that first meeting, the man who got up one of the few men that got up and defended the William of uh, the women was Frederick Douglass, who himself, of course, was a great abolitionist. And then also William Lloyd Garrison, the guy we talked about earlier. William Lloyd Garrison also was a defender. And his organization, the, uh, the Abolition Society, um, were split because they were, he wanted to let women have a role in the organization. You know, like be leaders and so on. And the men would not have any of that. <laughs> you, we can, you know, it's okay to sleep free slaves, but we, don't, we can't have women and leadership roles in the organization. So they split and created another organization, uh, a, a, a abolitionist organization, where the women did not have a part. Uh, one last story. My, my favorite story is that Wyoming, Wyoming, little Wyoming, which I think is still the smallest state in population and one of the largest states in the area, was the first to have women's suffrage. Hmm. 1869. Wow. Amazing. And they had, in 1870, the first female justice of the peace in the United States. Justice of the peace is not like here, you know, somebody who just does small things. There, justice of the peace was like the sheriff, right, out in South Pass, Wyoming. And there, she had to uh, arrest her own husband <laughs> because he was, he was brawling and drunk. And uh, so, it's the first case of, uh, of a woman arresting a man with the authority of the state in the United States. Amazing, right? Now, we only, what have we done? Three, four, three or four movements? I mean, there's, there's dozens of these. But I thought I would hit some of the more important ones historically. Uh, the abolitionist movement, the temperance movement, the, uh, um, what are they about? The, uh, the uh, women's suffrage movement. Um, these are all just such, you know, important movements. 
in our history and you know really changed. The, the biggest bust was temperance movement. I would say in the abolition of the movie is hugely successful. The suffrage movement was hugely successful. And so um, probably this is you know about half of the crusades will come to a great conclusion, but the other half fail or aren't very successful. The one that really knocks me out is the anti-smoking crusade. If you would have asked me and said 1970, do you think in the future people will be smoking? Are you kidding? I mean, in Dallas, any restaurant you went into, the smoke was everywhere. And then this thing gathered speed, steam, little by little. Then all of a sudden, they started saying smoking or not smoking when you came in. And they had a separate section for the people that smoked and a separate section for those. And they started putting the little slogans on the, on the cigarettes. You know, this, this cigarette will, will make you you a can make, fill you with cancer and so forth. And this is, I think, um, what's surprising about it. It wasn't done primarily with political action. There was never any federal legislation much less a, a constitutional amendment to say we're going to end smoking. <coughs> Yet smoking in public has virtually ended in the state. <laughs> Yet you take Japan, which is a very progressive and, and very, very bright people over there. It's, they, they, that's the most smoking nation in the world. Hmm. Did you know that? No. You, you go to Japan, you know, you're just in it all the time. So I, I think it's hard to say exactly how this happened, but I think the key to it is that people realize that secondhand smoke will kill you just as quick as firsthand smoke. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, I and grew up with that, but one thing, when I was studying a lot of this about 30 years ago, <coughs> yeah. 20, 30 years ago, they found that the tobacco itself, because the curious thing is how the Native Americans used so much tobacco mm -hmm. with their rituals, or why didn't they get all these diseases, right. they found that the ink on the paper wow. was one of the biggest but think carcinogenic. About, yeah, mm -hmm. think about ink. Are we going to breathe and inhale burned ink? Yeah. And they put a lot of things on the tobacco, yeah. which makes it a different product Chem yeah. than the natural. Chemicals. But yeah. the ink mm -hmm. the was ink. the really big thing. And of course, all of the manufacturers would put mm -hmm. their name mm -hmm. on the That's paper. That's very good. Very good. Well, um, We'll have um, something of interest next week. It be a surprise, okay? And uh, I sometimes follow the script, and quite often I don't, as, as is the case tonight. But we do cover some interesting topics. Yes, Roger. Well, as a Methodist, I just don't want people to go away believing everything they said about Methodists. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Yeah, you had to listen to that one, at least one of those stories from, from your church. Oh yeah, but we'll listen to it again next week. <laughs> that's, that's a compliment. Thank you for that. But you know, it's interesting you're talking about the iron lung before. I, yeah. I vaguely remembered something about iron lungs, but Catherine and I just watched a movie just this, well, late last week, called Freedom. And it's about a gentleman who developed polio. I don't know if anybody ever heard of this movie. It's mm -hmm. phenomenal. It's a true story. Hmm. And so he had a, had a uh, well, he had his, got married, wife was pregnant. Before the baby was born, he developed this condition. And he says, well, you need to go have a life. And she says, you are my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. So basically, later in the show, it says, well, my wife told me I had to stick around, and so I did. <laughs> no, that's but it, it's a story of how he refused his position and they invented a chair so they could wander around and actually mm -hmm. take him to the beach and stuff like that and it freed like 60,000 of these people in this iron lung. Mm -hmm. It's wow. a very interesting movie. Wow. Very interesting. What's the name of the movie? It's called Freedom. 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 Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Breathe. Yeah, it's called Breathe. Breathe. Uh, Breathe. Yeah. Breathe, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, that, that was terrifying for kids to be in that terrible machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, sorry to keep it so long. Well, I'm oh, going to bring another aspect with polio, because yeah. I was studying massage therapy also mm -hmm. about 20 years ago, and 
there was a woman who lived next door or was, I mean, mm-hmm. God knows how long ago that was, the Olympic gold medal track winner from whatever year that was in the 40s, right. who had polio as a baby. The next door neighbor came over every day and massaged oh, sure. the babies. That was the, that was the therapy of a lady named Sister Kenny, mm-hmm. and there's the Sister Kenny Foundation, and her most famous patient was a actor by the name of Alan Arkin, mm-hmm. you know from mm-hmm. Mash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he he was massaged. He had polio, mm-hmm. and he was massaged, and he always says, you know, I owe my life to all these women, mm-hmm. uh, but. Sister Kenny and his mother were at the well, top. Well, they said this really is a disease of the nerve, not the muscle. Keep mm-hmm. the muscle alive, and when the nerves regain, they'll be mm-hmm. okay. But the damage for so many, because I dated a young man who had polio mm-hmm. as a 18 month old. And they broke his leg and cut it up and all these different pieces, so his legs could never work. He was mm-hmm. a crutches in wheelchair. It oh, was, terrible. was a horrible story, but he was yeah. a fantastic person. So, mm-hmm. that's about the Same time. with John Robbins. Oh yeah, many stories like him. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. Thank you.